Good evening and welcome to the March 8th regular meeting of the City of Arcata's Planning Commission. We're holding this meeting as an in-person hybrid in order to be compliant with the governor's order in-5-22 as well as the Department of Health's guidance in the use of face masks. Although the wearing of face mask is no longer required in City Hall, it is strongly encouraged and appreciated as well as social dis distancing. If you wish to make a public comment during the meeting, there are three ways you can do it while on your computer. If you wish to speak during the public comment portion of any item, click, click on the raise your hand icon on the right hand side of your screen. When the public comment period opens, you will be unmuted and you'll have three minutes to speak. If you are on your phone, you can also join the meeting and comment by calling the number and meeting ID, all of which is so shown at the bottom of the screen. Press star nine to let the clerk know you wish to speak. Again, when the public comment period opens, you will be unmuted and you'll have three minutes to speak. If you are in attendance, you can also approach the microphone and make your comment. Again, you'll have three minutes. This meeting is now officially called to order. Director Loya, can we get a roll call? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Figueroa? Present. Commissioner White? Present. Commissioner Barstow? Here. Uh, Vice Chair Mayor? Here. And Chair of the State Elcock? Here. And at the staff's table, we have uh, David Loya, our Director of Community Development. And so I'll note that uh, Commissioner Tagney and Commissioner Davies are not yet in attendance. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's move on to oral communications. This time is provided for people to address the commission or submit written communications on matters not on this evening's agenda. At the conclusion of all oral and written communications, the commission may respond to statements. Any request that requires commission actions will be set by the commission for a future agenda or referred to staff. Is there any member of the public who would like to address the commission? Yes. Um, the, there are some attendees raising their hands on Zoom, and I'll just uh, note that the way that the council meetings have been working, and it's been working pretty well, is that they'll take all of the attendees on Zoom first, and then go to attendees in the uh, audience. Obviously, we don't have anybody in attendance tonight uh, at this point, so we'll go ahead and start with those who are online. Go ahead, Patricia. Um, yeah, good evening, commissioners and staff. Um, I'm representing the community group Responsible Growth Arcata, and we would like to present the following for your consideration. During the City Council's goals study session on March 1st, there was a discussion of whether the gateway plan should be developed as a specific plan as it, as it was originally proposed. Um, a City Council member requested that the Planning Commission discuss which of those of the two approaches you know either a specific or an area plan would be more appropriate and also was curious to when and why it changed um, to become an area plan another council member voiced the need for more understanding and information about the difference differences between these two planning approaches and also requested that it be discussed by the planning commission for example under statute 65451A2, a specific plan would be required to uh, identify the major infrastructure components needed to support planned land, land uses. Community plans and area plans are not required to contain similar an, 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 uh, analysts. So in our view, um, our thorough identification of the infrastructure necessary to um, support the gateway plan is far too important of a topic to defer. Um, we feel that an honest and clinical discussion of the trade-offs of these two approaches will be informative for the commissioners, um, but the city council and also for the community. So our group, RGA, respectfully um, requests that the chair address the concerns of the council members and place this on the agenda for the next planning commission meeting on March 22nd. So um, uh, we just want to thank you also for your dedication and service to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Do we have anyone else? No? All right, um, on to the consent calendar. The only item that we have is the minutes from February 22nd. 
Do any of the commissioners uh, need to pull that item or can we get a motion to approve? I think there, there did appear to be an error and so I'd um, like to pull it. Okay, we're gonna pull that, the minutes. What was the error? Uh, it, was in, it was in the public hearings um, where it said that a motion was by Commissioner Davies and also seconded by um, Commissioner Davies, um, which I, I don't think is correct. And, and I, I wouldn't have caught it except for the fact that I couldn't remember who made the motion and I couldn't remember who seconded it. Okay, would uh, you th like Thanks for bringing that to our attention. It should have been a motion by Tagney and second by Davies. So we'll Thanks very much. Um, would you like to make a motion? In that case, um, I'll move to um, approve the minutes. I'll second. Uh, with, with that change. Okay, so we have a motion from Commissioner Mayer and a second from Commissioner White. Do we, um, can we get a roll call please? Uh, Commissioner Figueroa? Aye. Commissioner White? Aye. Commissioner Barstow? Aye. Vice Chair Mayer? Aye. And Chair of State Alcock? Aye, so motion approved to approve the consent calendar. Now we will move on to public hearings, of which we have none, and so we'll move on to business items. Uh, local coastal element update. Can we get a staff report, please? Uh, yes, good evening, um, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation for you tonight and um, do have a little bit of setup. Uh, we. Uh, started our in-depth review of the local coastal element portion of the um, the local coastal program uh, at your last meeting, and uh, so I wanted to make this a, a regular topic uh, as we alternate between the long-range planning documents that we're working on currently, um, and to give the commission and the public ad you know ample time and opportunity to to comment and weigh on. One of the biggest issues that we'll be dealing with in this local coastal program update, <clears throat> obviously, is sea level rise and policy around sea level rise. And so I wanted to focus tonight on uh, history of the sea level rise uh, response in the city of Arcata, uh, and then to uh, bring that together with the uh, recommendations that are made in the draft local coastal element, and then dig into that policy into any uh, detail that you see fit. So I'll just start uh, with this PowerPoint presentation, uh, sea level rise response. I will note that the uh, city council took this matter up at their uh, last meeting as well, and so it would be um, uh, you know, good to go and watch that. <laughs> Uh, that that uh, meeting as well. Uh, there's some background in that meeting that I do, don't provide uh, in this meeting that would also be useful for commissioners, both who have heard this before, but it's been a while, as well as those of you who um, are new and maybe haven't heard this before. So I wanted to key you into that. Okay. So I'm gonna start off with uh, just sort of an overview of some of the work that we've done in the past, just to orient us to what has been done before and where do we get direction uh, for the uh, draft that's before you today. So this, uh, this picture was from a uh, PowerPoint presentation we did, I wanna say in 2016. And kind of the concept here, this was from a flood, I believe in the 80s, I wanna say, maybe the 70s. And you can see that the flooding is, is fairly extensive. It covers parts of Highway 101. Uh, here you can see in the mid-ground, um, the flooding backs up behind uh, the, you know, the overpass here and into Old Arcata Road. 
uh, and gets into the Arcata Sports Complex. So this is pretty extensive flooding. Um, and we kind of look at this as, you know, quote unquote, a blast from the past and fast forward to the future uh, because these same extents are projected in our vulnerability analyses as being, being potentially subject to flooding in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you, the next couple of slides are actually from the April 30, 2018 City Council Planning Commission study session. Uh, and the objective of the study session uh, outlined here was to really do a recap on the work that we had done since 2016, uh, work in earnest on the, uh, the local coastal program. Uh, as well as to seek direction. And this, this meeting uh, is one at which we uh, ratified the direction that uh, staff was recommending to, uh, to move forward with this planning effort. So we identified, you know, sea level rise refresher, looked at the background documents, um, talked about how the coastal program works, uh, looked at some of the uh, land use policies, and then talked about the implementation plan. We rehashed that, uh, you know, the sea level rise projections, again, show extents uh, up to approximately where you saw on that first picture I showed you. And one of the emphasis, uh, one of the points we tried to emphasize was that sea level rise is not just a uh, bayfront issue. Um, right here in the, uh, this portion of, of Arcata, uh, where the creek comes by uh, Villa Way, you can see that uh, sea level rise impacts up to the, the blue portion here uh, will, will impact these neighborhoods and these drainage systems. Um, when you know when when sea level rise is is at a certain point, already these drainage systems are partially tidally influenced, and so as the sea level rises, they'll get more and more uh, tidally influenced further and further up the reaches. So that was one of the main points that we were looking at, um, you know, this high level. Back in 2016, we gave an overview of uh, climate change uh, science in general. We talked about these vulnerability analyses that we're using this bathtub model where you basically just fill up the bay to a certain elevation um, and see what does that look like on the map, <clears throat> which has some limitations that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we looked at different projections, and you know there were there are several different projections uh, even today, depending on your uh, risk um, tolerance. And then we talked a lot about how we had done some work looking at what is the current um, levee system around Arcata look like? What are the elevations? And so we can dig into that in a little more detail if you're interested. But we already have a protected system. Um, the the dikes, if they went away today. The flood, the tidal flood waters would come into about the inland extents that you see on this uh, image to the to the left here. In 2017, we advanced this work a little bit further, and we had put forward this concept of uh, having a phased adaptation strategy, this measured retreat where we would slowly walk back from areas that were uh, subject to uh, potential inundation in the future, focusing on uh, you know first. Uh, releasing assets that were, you know, lower protective value and or, uh, you know, had already been planned for, um, for, for uh, accommodation, like McDaniel Slough. Um, and to focus on this, what we at that time were calling the urban peninsula or the protection peninsula, uh, which now is just referred to as uh, Zone 1. So the idea being that this area down South g &H Street that has the wastewater treatment plant at the very tip, lots of industrial uses and commercial uses, lots of residential uses, and a couple other commercial and industrial uses off to the, um, the west here, that those would be subject to some form of protection over the course of time. Um, this little graphic in the center here <clears throat> does some of the uh, back of the napkin estimates that we had been using to try and identify whether this was a uh, you know, valuable consideration, an area that was worth protecting. Um, in short, the uh, image here shows you that there were approximately $141 million worth of assets in 2017 dollars uh, at the time, and that would cost a total of $15.4 million to protect 18 feet. And so this was, uh, you know, as we were presenting at the time, uh, a fiscally uh, feasible and, and reasonable uh, trade-off between those two value systems up to that point at least. 
Um, I'll say just by uh, way of passing an alternative concept, one that's been promulgated by many, is that, well, if this is in a mapped inundation zone, why don't you just start, uh, you know, um, you know, defeasing of these properties now. Why don't you start pulling uses back and 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 start the adaptation process today? Why wait? Um, and so we can we can talk in a little bit more about that in detail when we're looking at some of these other maps. But we we contrast with that. We say no. We want to ultimately. As long as it's feasible to protect our city boundaries, our existing uses, that we want to continue to do that, but then also plan for a shift in those uses so when it's time to retreat, it's easier to do so. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We talked about the different strategies on the one end of the spectrum for protection, accommodation in the middle, which would be you know either accommodating the floodwaters or designing um, so that they are um, you know adaptable and then retreat on the far other end of the spectrum, but that adaptation is ultimately um, you know, a, a spectrum of activities that we would use for different asset types, depending on their risk tolerance and on the threat to those assets. And so for example, we don't wanna site a new critical facility, a new emergency room hospital in an area that's gonna be subject to you know, future inundation or potentially tsunami hazard, uh, but it may be okay to you know, site some new businesses in that area um, and so that's, that's kind of the approach that we took. We had uh, over 2016 to 2018, a ton of public outreach. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, proudest of because I feel like our uh, little pilot project that we were doing out here on King Tide um, photo documentation uh, was picked up by the Coastal Commission and, and they now have a statewide program where coastal communities all across the state are doing this. Um, I, I don't know that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, had any influence over them rolling that program out, but I know for a fact that we did it first, so I'm gonna claim that we did. Uh, but we had a lot of public engagement through 2016 to 2018 and took a lot of that information that was ultimately baked into uh, the document that you have before you tonight. Uh, we also entered into a couple of contracts to get more uh, uh, specific resolution on our uh, vulnerability, our responses, what the local sea level rise predictions would be. So we worked with Alderon Laird and he focused mostly on uh, vulnerability of assets. And we also worked with Northern Hydrology Engineering and they worked mostly uh, on uh, sort of replicating the Ocean Protection Council uh, uh, approved methods for estimating sea level rise projections, but then base them on local data so that we have real localized Arcata Bay sea level rise projections, which has been uh, very helpful uh, trying to do our, our adaptation planning. Um, I'm gonna run real quickly through sort of the uh, the pitch that we've been giving or the, the education uh, pitch that we've been giving on this to help help us make decisions. Uh, focusing on these white circles, you see um, Old Arcata Road, uh, the bend at Jacoby Creek there, uh, the, the pretzel on 101 to 255. Um, and our wastewater treatment oxidation ponds. Those are a point of reference for the, the following maps. So in these, we're looking at current elevations on the right here. This is a uh, LIDAR elevation. So going from cool colors that are low to hot colors that are high. I don't have you have specific elevations here, uh, but essentially you can see this break in slope at about the yellow point, And then it jumps up into the red elevations. That mirrors over real well with the 1870 shoreline. Um, and so you can see, you know, our wastewater treatment plant, the pretzel, and Old Arcata Road in each of these. And you can see that they're all in low-lying areas. The vulnerability analyses, not surprisingly, show that um, those areas would be inundated when with future sea level rise. Now, I just wanna draw your attention to the fact that the inundation footprint doesn't extend much farther beyond that yellow topographic line that I showed you in the last uh, image. Um, the other thing I want to share with you, and it's a little bit more poignant in the upcoming um, slide, but that the, um, you know, these inland extents, again, would be about the same if we breach the dikes today as they will be with 100 years of sea level rise projected. So that's an important thing to think about. There are some communities where they're experiencing radically different shifts in the way that the tide influences their communities 
um, that you know have uh, you know far-ranging implications on built infrastructure, built environment. Um, I'm not saying that we're not going to have that experience, but what I am saying is that even with six feet of sea level rise, there's not much of a difference between the current inland extent of uh, tidal flooding and projected future inland extent of tidal fl flooding. What that suggests to me is that we have, uh, as opposed to you know some other communities, we have a little bit more uh, tools in our tool belt on how we respond to these conditions, these future conditions. Okay, so this is a map uh, that is in your current LCP. It was updated for uh, tonight's agenda and you should have received in your packet a printed eight and a half by 11 uh, copy or 11 by 17, I'm not sure which. I guess it's eight and a half by 11. Copy of a, 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 a full color map. And what we've, what we've done here is we've shown um, Instead of as many uh, folks are used to thinking about it, you know, what's the elevation at a given time? We're showing just the elevations with a certain amount of sea level rise applied to it. Now there's a, a couple of reasons for this approach. Number one, sea level rise projections are constantly shifting. We're always hearing uh, news about an updated projection and now, you know, what was 2030 is now gonna ha happen in 2025 and you know, so on and so forth. So the, the projections are always uh, going up and they're always getting worse. I think there's some uh, uh, usefulness in thinking about when will certain things happen, but there's a lot more utility in thinking about uh, at what elevations do various things get inundated? How long, what are the frequencies of those inundations? You know, are there, uh, are there other alternatives uh, than just retreat that could help uh, you know, manage those, those inundations? So what we've shown here in the blue, uh, again, is our current tidal prism. So this is basically our mean annual maximum water. This is our average king tide, is what you're seeing in blue here. Now everyone knows uh, on the king tides that we don't get flooding up into the baylands, we don't get flooding on the Christie property. Certainly there's no flooding into the oxidation ponds and South G Street is not flooded. So you have to ask yourself, well, well, if the inland extent of today's tidal flooding uh, would go to this, this point, um, and if I don't see that kind of flooding today, then what's going on? Well, the what's going on is that we have levees in place that manage those tidal waters. Uh, you know, 100 plus years ago, uh, levees were placed all around the bay, uh, reclaiming those, uh, those tide lands, and they were put into agricultural production. Uh, so those reclaimed uh, former tide lands are all behind that defensive structure. Our South G and H Street is also part of that defensive structure. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, S Samoa is part of that defensive structure as well. And so it was, it was instructive, I think, in our local coastal element to put this image in here to show you the difference between, uh, you know, current inland projected extents based on this bathtub model where you just fill up to a certain elevation. And the projected future inland extents if you give it three feet and six feet of sea level rise. The uh, USGS is actually working on a project called Cosmos right now where they're mapping uh, a little bit more sensitively sea level rise inundation that does take into consideration those intervening uh, um, uh, geographical features. And so we believe that you know sometime in the next year or two we'll have uh, better modeling for this. Uh, in addition, we're looking to uh, uh, apply for a Coastal Commission grant soon to do a little bit more sophisticated modeling for our area. But for right now, this is the state of the art. This is the best we can do in terms of representing this graphically. Now, one thing that's important to note here, um, that just because you see a map like this doesn't mean that's going to be the daily condition. So this blue area is our mean annual maximum water. So this is the king tide average. This happens a couple of times a year. Certainly the tides around the king tide are also very high. Some of them approximate and approach the king tide. And so there are going to be you know, periods or frequencies when we'll experience this level of inundation. But to address that, we put forward um, the 
uh, in the upper right-hand corner of that map that we inserted into your packet tonight, um, the base year, which is 2012 in our Northern Hydrology Report, along with the mean maximum monthly water, so the average high tide, recognizing that you know the tides follow a seasonal pattern and that they're higher in the winter than they are in the summer. Uh, the mean annual uh, maximum water, so that's the king tide. We put the 100-year event and then the 2100 probability of exceeding that elevation. And so in this table, it's important to note that, for example, uh, with a half a meter of elevation, uh, that would be 10 feet for mean annual maximum water, which is you know slightly higher than our current mean annual maximum water. And there's a 54% probability that by 2100, we'll have that elevation. So 50-50 so chance by 2100, half the, time, half the, half the uh, future realities have this level of inundation, half don't, half have less. Uh, to get to one meter by 2100, there's a 2% probability of that occurring. And so all in all likelihood, and this is, again, these numbers are with the, uh, what's called RPC 8.5, so the higher uh, emissions scenario for sea level rise projections. Um, there's a 98% chance we're gonna be less than what's projected at a meter in a, by 2100. So we're just trying to introduce some concepts here that it's more than just looking at a map and seeing like, oh my gosh, the floodwaters are gonna be up to that elevation. We should really do something now. We wanna make sure that we're taking into consideration the probability that that will happen and the probability that uh, those impacts will occur and really right-sizing those for the types of uh, uh, decisions that we make about the policy that we implement now and um, how we roll out our uh, adaptation strategy overall. So just to give you a real concrete example of what that looks like, um, Planning for a meter of sea level rise by 2100 with a 0.2% probability makes a lot of sense if you want to site a hospital. You don't want to put a hospital in harm's way, even if there's a remote chance that that's going to be in harm's way. You want to plan for putting those in the most logical places that will not be impacted by natural disasters, will not be subject to regular inundation, and not be serviceable in the future when you need them. Um, someone taking and deciding to, uh, you know, build their own home in that area, if there's a 2% probability that that home will still be viable and standing in 70 years, if they build it today, they're likely to say, you know, that's an acceptable risk to me. That is, I can accept that return on the investment type of risk that in 70 years, the home that I build today will still be standing. And if we go beyond that, if it's, you know, if it hits beyond that 98% probability that it'll be standing and, and I get into that 2% range, and in fact, my house is flooding, um, then we have policies for uh, requiring that they remove that, that house. But it's on a different order of magnitude between, uh, you know, citing public facilities or critical facilities and, and individuals, uh, you know, decisions about their own finances. We also leverage uh, this concept in some of the policy language that ultimately led to a commercial visitor serving overlay in the coastal zone that we'll, we'll look at in a minute, reasoning that if, if we um, bring forward zoning types that allow for investment in new uses that will shift those use patterns so that you don't have, uh, you know, uses like, you know, homes where people are going to, you know, lose their homes or, or, you know, the salvage yard I'd mentioned last time that, you know, if they can clean up that salvage yard and turn it into an RV park, then it'll be much, much easier in the future to, uh, to implement an adaptation and retreat strategy that allows for the continued use of that property and just instead of just saying you can't build anything out there. Okay, so everyone wants to know when is this going to happen? And we talked a little bit about this uh, already, but the projections go everywhere from, uh, you know, low with bandwidth to extremely high. And they're all over the map and it really depends on what the future scenarios are. Uh, most of us in the planning world are use in, using this R RCP 8.5 I mentioned. It's the uh, increasing emissions scenario. It doesn't rely on uh, reduction of, of uh, emissions, you know, out to say, you know, tw uh, 2050. Um, 
you know, when we right now we've currently got about as much uh, greenhouse gases uh, baked into the system that we're going to get a certain amount of, of uh, sea level rise anyway. And then beyond that, that's really where policy can change. You know, large scale national and, and global policy can change that trajectory, but we're not counting on that. We're using this RCP 8.5. Whoops, why am I not advancing? Oh, it's a problem when you have two computers. Um, okay, so when is it going to happen? We took a look at these three scenarios that are, uh, you know, and this is just a cartoon representation of the three uh, um, likely scenario with uh, sort of the extreme end and the lower lower end of the projections for that um, that RCP 8.5 scenario and looking at the elevations that would occur in 20, two, uh, 2030, 2050 and 2100. Um, and this is the typical way of looking at it. And mo more often than not, um, you know, folks will tell you, well, you know, plan for the worst and that way, you know, things will get, if things get better, then, it, then it's great. The problem with that thinking is doesn't, it doesn't take into consideration if you plan for the worst and you tell someone you can't invest in your home, then you lose all of that investment that would have happened. You lose all that livelihood, that vibrancy, that, that community um, uh, space that you could have had in, in the coastal zone during that time frame. And so we want to make sure that we're right-sizing the projections for the types of uses. But, but if we look at these, you know, typically people would look at this and say, hey, look, there's a huge difference between maybe 11 feet, if this is feet in elevation and this is time on the bottom here, you know, 11 feet or 12 feet with this lowest case scenario and 15 feet with this highest case scenario, you know, that's a big difference. So around this time, we started thinking about, well, what happens if you project these out way into the future? And instead of thinking about the time when this is going to happen and being uncertain based on the projection that you're using, what if instead we said, look, there's a, um, you know, an elevation that we can protect to. In this graphic, we're just saying arbitrarily that it's 18 feet of elevation. We can build levees around the city of Arcata and protect to 18 feet of elevation. And then you ask yourself, well, when do we hit 18 feet? Instead of looking at, at 2100, am I at 11 or am I at 15? We would be looking at, is this gonna happen in 2100? or is it going to happen in 2200 based on these projections? And so sort of turning the, the time frame on its head a little bit to think a little bit differently about uh, the uncertainty in these projections. If you were to tell someone today, you can't do something because of, some, you can't do something, because of something that's gonna happen in 2100, they'd be pretty upset. They'd be really upset if you were off by 100 years and it was actually gonna be 2200 and you told them they couldn't do it today. So this is the kind of uh, thinking that went into the process. We dug into a lot of detail with the Ocean Protection Council's uh, projections that they put out for the state around the probabilities. It's really important to understand probability when you're thinking about sea level rise. It's not just a static elevation and it's not just 100% certainty that it's going to happen. So looking at the North Spit, and again, these are the projections that are included in the OPC's 2018 guidance, uh, looking at high emissions, RCP 8.5, so the high emissions projection. This table tells you the probability that sea level rise will meet or exceed these elevations. Now again, uh, uh, side note here, this doesn't include the, you know, the H++ scenario, the Antarctic melt melts and, and we suddenly are subject to 20 feet of sea level rise. This is just looking at the, the probability, probabilistic models. Well, to get to six feet of elevation, so that one meter by 2100, here's that 2%. This is straight out of OPC guidance. So, you know, if I were to say to you, hey, you have a 2% chance of winning my roulette table, how much do you want to bet on it? Probably going to say not a lot. If I said you had a 90% chance of winning my roulette table, you might throw down a lot of chips. So there's a 90% chance we're gonna meet or exceed two feet of sea level rise. Uh, there's a 2% chance that we're gonna meet or exceed six feet by 2100. And going out this table even farther, you can see it's infinitesimally small that we would get to two meters or, or even 10 feet. 0.1% chance that that probability, 0.1% uh, chance that that eventuality would happen. 
So it's important to look at these tables and we've structured our recommendations based on both the probabilistic models, how likely is this for different asset types, as well as the, um, uh, the inundation risk. Once it does reach that, how often, how frequently are we going to experience those conditions and can we um, you know, protect those assets by enhancing the existing levies? Okay, so the next question is, what are we gonna do? Uh, this is where this elevation analysis of existing levies came in. Uh, this uh, information was used to make the estimates on how much the levies would cost uh, to protect that protection area. Um, I'm gonna skip a little bit of that. And ultimately, the direction was given to, yes, let's pursue this quote unquote protection zone. Uh, now we're referring to it as the adaptation zone um, where basically we would fall back uh, last. So the, uh, you know, just super big picture, the idea is that these low-lying areas around this that are, you know, in lower uh, value uh, uses and have already some adaptive capacity uh, would, would be less protected. It's not to say we would stop protecting them today, but you know, if, uh, you know, if sea level rise is rising quickly enough to overtop the levees that protect these bottom lands, we would let those go first and start thinking of those in terms of uh, habitat qualities as opposed to, you know, maybe agricultural qualities. We'd be looking to restore these lands and, and maybe use those as wetland banks to, um, to offset the impacts, the minor impacts that we'll have to wetlands as we're you know, protecting the rest of the city. Um, and so this was overall the, the, the strategy that was uh, kind of directed in 2018. The goal was to uh, create desirable and feasible adaptation. The objective is to develop criteria for suitable investment of public and private resources. And we would have a strategy that implemented a measured retreat. So we would accommodate the uh, tidal uh, where planned and, inf and infeasible to defend. We would adapt uses and assets that are infeasible to defend that are in those zones. We would defend where it's feasible. We would protect the areas like South GH streets and ultimately retreat where and when no longer feasible to defend or adapt. So that's the overall strategy that we've uh, been given. So right now in your packet, you'll have, uh, you know, this, this image, uh, I believe it's 8-2, um, figure 8-2, 2-8-2. Um, and this demonstrates this zone one where we would fall, fall back last. Ultimately, you know, if the sea level rise, uh, I'm sorry, it was in the, uh, the packet from last time. We didn't replicate the LCP uh, this time. Um, and uh, the, we would fall back last to, you know, Samoa Boulevard would be sort of the last line of defense uh, if this area was no longer feasible to defend zone one. Zone two would be the, the first to go. And then we have some interim strategies, for example, the oxidation ponds for the wastewater treatment plant um, ultimately could be a first step in retreating from zone one that would offer an opportunity for establishing new wetlands, new habitat that would you know, provide some storm surge protection, some, um, you know, some, some settling pond uh, protection potentially. Um, and then you know, ultimately this would be planned for and phased with, you know, a retreat strategy for the wastewater treatment plant that we'll be looking to do over the course of the next, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, depending on how quickly sea level rise uh, occurs. Um, and then by that time, you know, the, um, you know, the plan will be in full force and effect to, to have the rest of this, this land retreat as necessary. Um, again, I want to point out, we talked about this at our last meeting, that the gateway area plan, which is just north of Samoa, <clears throat> is heavily in involved in our sea level rise strategy, our retreat strategy. We have hundreds of homes in this area that we can re relocate into that area. Okay, so just shifting, uh, and I believe this is the last slide, to the proposed zoning in the local coastal program. 
this was uh, received, this was based on the direction the Planning Commission gave in December when we looked at these uh, to make these modifications. I don't have listed here all of the changes, and so there might be a few minor changes elsewhere that I won't point out. Uh, but I will point to a couple of the major changes that we had talked about. The first is that you know some of these um, uh, properties here, like we discussed last time, will become uh, mixed use in this local coastal program update. Some of these are industrial. Some of these are commercial right now, but we are just labeling them all mixed use. And that will sort of set the stage for whatever becomes adopted into the gateway plan, ultimately being able to easily be transitioned into a local coastal program update uh, that mirrors because that is really a mixed use plan. Um, the other major change uh, that we have here uh, is this CCV, Coastal Commercial Visitor uh, Zoning designation that covers a large part of uh, the protection zone that's privately held. And again, the point of this zone is to try and encourage uh, conversion of land use, uh, you know, away from, in, in particular, the, the industrial uses that are happening in these pink zones. Um, there were some changes that the uh, Planning Commission also recommended in land use types in the northern side. I didn't show that on this map, but um, this land use map is in your local coastal element. Uh, and uh, those changes, I think we went over last time, the, the spear and alliance changes from residential low and very low to residential medium density. Um, so those are, uh, those are the uh, slides that I had prepared. That's kind of what I wanted to uh, go over tonight in terms of the presentation. And really now it's just an opportunity to kind of open it up. We could take a, a deeper dive on the local coastal element, if you wish, to look at some of that policy language. And I can connect the dots between the discussions that we've had that I've just conveyed tonight about the overall strategy and how we've translated that into policy language, if you wish. Um, you know, or if you have specific comments, um, or recommendations, we can we can take a look at those too. Thank you very much. So staff is looking for <clears throat> questions and um, to provide guidance to staff. So does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, Commissioner Mayor? Um, I have a couple of questions first. And can you hear me with the mask on? Um, barely, yeah. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I'll take it off just um, to speak into the mic. Is this better? Okay. Um, the first one is, um, in all of these assessments, have is there a mechanism built in to incorporate more recent um, scientific analyses of the rate of change of sea levels as um, we learn about them. You know, we're we're all very aware that the the most recent um, FPCCC report indicates an accelerating rate of sea level rise, um, and it, it it seems as though your charts can deal with that. Um, but the sort of benchmarking system in the action parts of the plan. Um, might need to be adjusted in terms of our risk assessments. Is that is that something that's built into this planning process? And maybe you could explain how. Yeah, I think part of the um, <clears throat> concern over continuously uh, increasing rates or you know changes in the science and how that would impact our plan if we were to establish time frames uh, associated with these uh, sea level rise projections was. Part of the motivation for shifting away from including that in the document, and so I would say that our uh, our document is completely insensitive to changes in rates as they're projected, and completely addresses uh, the um, the impacts because instead of focusing on uh, the timelines at which the elevations will be achieved, which would be you know 
superseded by subsequent um, projections. We just focus on the elevations and what those trigger points are for the elevations. In fact, in, in some of the policy language, we explicitly state that we know that sea level will ultimately rise to a certain, you know, it will certainly rise and that the projects will likely be subject to inundation. And we specifically say that there's, we're not telling you when that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna guarantee that you have a 30 year term or a 50 year term. Each investor has to make that decision for themselves. Um, I do want to ensure that before we adopt this plan that those uh, probabilities are as updated as possible. Um, even those will, will likely be um, you know, outmoded, outdated, uh, you know, as these projections change because they're, they're, you know, uh, relational to one another. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I think that that, um, you know, we can address, uh, you know, through either periodic updates if necessary or just recognizing that, you know, the, the best available science is what we'd be using. Obviously, you know, if the rate of sea level rise change, um, you know, outpaces, the uh, city's ability to manage retreat, um, then you know we're, we're we're basically we're not in a planning scenario anymore. I mean, many people have looked at the projections that I showed on the last um, set of slides and said, well, yeah, why don't you plan for that H plus plus scenario? You need to plan for that, you know, that biggest case scenario. And the reality is, is that's tr just really not a planning scenario. If we're going to have 20 feet of sea level rise between now and 2100, then we're not really going to be worried about um, you know low lying areas. I mean, 20 feet of sea level rise is going to, you know, come up to the north town, uh, foothills of north town. It's going to be completely inundating, uh, you know, um, you know, all of our bottom low lying bottomland um, subdivisions, um, and 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 that rate of change will be much much faster than our capacity to to manage uh, retreat. So that's more like a disaster planning scenario as opposed to a uh, you know a, a planning scenario, a development planning scenario. Uh, okay, so so that's a good seg to my next question, which is um, the the draft plan deals with the sea level rise issues and the hazard mitigation issues for things like um, seismic hazards, um, tsunami, et cetera, um, in, in separate sections. But in reality, the, those areas in, I think you've called them zone one, um, of unconsolidated soils that would also be inundated um, with sea level rise are, are the same ones where the soil would turn to mush um, in, a, in a big quake or the large tsunami that um, we're probably a little overdue for. So I'm wondering if that combined set of risks um, fed into some of the land use designations and retreat strategies that you've been trying to put together. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. Um, and I think that if you look at our hazard map for the city of Arcata in the general plan, you'll see that the majority of the city has multiple overlapping hazards. It just does. It's got, you know, you know haz a hazard map. Uh, Thank you, Colin. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll start over for the public's benefit because they couldn't hear what I was saying. Uh, if you look at the city of Arcata's uh, hazard maps in the general plan, you'll find that the majority of the city is has overlapping uh, hazards. And so there's, there's really nowhere in the city that doesn't have a situation that has multiple hazards. Um, and each of the different hazard situations has different timelines, trigger points, and you know scenarios for responding to them. And so, you know, I think it's appropriate to segregate those uh, different hazards into the sections to really identify what policies specifically address them. Uh, if you think about it, you know, it would be similar to our safety element where we address different subject matter and under sub separate subheadings. Um, um, but I, it, it does not play into the decision-making process that because a particular site has uh, both a tsunami hazard 
a liquefaction hazard and a potential sea level rise uh, vulnerability that that site should not be developed in a way that another site that doesn't share those characteristics should be um, for two primary reasons. Number one, um, we would basically conclude that the entire city of Arcata is not developable uh, using that methodology. And then number two, because the, um, uh, you know, because of what I described earlier, that the, the, the hazards are typically independent of one another um, and on, on completely separate timelines. So I hope that answers the question. It does. Um, and I, I guess the third question is um, going back to those protective structures around what you're To, to, what, to what extent would um, providing those protective structures around the sewage treatment plant and South G&H Street, um, and we've heard a lot about the, 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 the living coastline and all of those gradual inclines up to what are now the wastewater treatment ponds, to what extent would um, building and maintaining those require changing uh, state or federal law? That's a great question too. Um, this goes back to sort of the um, elevator pitch that we had uh, related to this topic in 2017-18 that, you know, the Coastal Act was, uh, you know, basically invented when the world was flat. We now know it's round. And so um, in my humble opinion, we need some updates to the Coastal Act uh, itself. We need some legislative fixes to identify and understand, um, you know, how to, uh, you know, to implement these, these adaptation strategies. Um, I fully respect folks who don't believe that's the case and think that, you know, we should, um, you know, just, just be retreating and not doing any kind of protection. Um, and I think that's the conversation that, you know, we need to have as a, you know, as a community, uh, both locally and statewide. Um, some of the, um, some of these projects, I mean, I, I guess there's not a real direct answer to that. Some of these projects could uh, potentially be incorporated into, um, you know, restoration projects, for example. Uh, the McDaniel Slough project is a perfect example of a restoration project that had a fallback levy. We removed a levy and we built a levy and the Coastal Commission approved it. And so it is possible to create uh, new levies in the coastal zone. Um, I believe that those levees, uh, some, some portions of those levees uh, even may have impacted coastal wetlands. And so there, there are also, you know, uh, elements within the existing Coastal Act that would allow for uh, not only levy, levy creation, but, you know, potentially wetland impacts uh, with mitigation. Um, but I do think it's a, a, you know, an untested uh, element to you know our local coastal program um, it's a an area where you know we are certainly at uh, greatest risk of the coastal commission having you know major concerns with our local coastal program um, and it's also an area where in fact there's there's very little uh, impact of us making the statement that we believe levies should be created to protect these assets because the majority of the lands that are uh, subject to this type of uh, infrastructure is in the Coastal Commission's retained jurisdiction. So we wouldn't have any say, our local coastal program wouldn't have any uh, influence over the decision to add a levy or not. All of those decisions would be made at the Coastal Commission level. And so in, in, in a lot of regards, this is our statement of purpose, our statement of, um, you know, of policy uh, that really has no practical application beyond just informing the community and the co commission that we believe that these areas should be protected into the future. And would be happy to work with the uh, Coastal Commission on a legislative fix to the Coastal Act. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commission? No? I have a, just a couple of questions. Um, so who maintains the uh, 
the levees, the dikes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's really up to the individual landowners at this point. Uh, there's no, you know, uh, you know, reclamation district or, or you know, um, you know, uh, countywide or, or regionwide entity that does that. Um, it would be great if we could uh, create one. Uh, the way that the policy language uh, leads leans into this issue is to. Uh, in, in areas where we don't currently have easements, uh, then we would be requesting those as people came in in the future uh, for for projects. Um, let me share a, an image so we can just talk about this for a sec. Okay, I know how to do this, I swear. There it is. Okay, so in this area, for example, on the backside, this is uh, uh, G Street, and here's all the industrial lands. There's a nice little business park down here. Uh, we would need to acquire uh, an easement to this backside here to, to maintain and, and build a levee. So property owner X comes in and says, hey, I want to do a project. We say, great, two things. You got to give us an easement. You got to build out uh, the the core for this levee, and you got to um, let us have a trail on it. So we got to have public public egress as well as the easement to maintain a, a, a levee. And we work with all of the property owners on this side to obtain similar easements. And one by one, as the projects come in, they would contribute to construction of the levy, uh, or maybe we'd be, you know, saving money through some sort of special tax for the levy district. Um, and then ultimately, we would build this out, and this would both be sea level rise protection from the backside as waters start to encroach from here, as well as uh, in addition to our um, our trail system, so that people could uh, walk on the levees. I was just wondering if the public is seeing this. Um, it doesn't look like the view is on that right now. So how many privately owned uh, levees or dikes, are they the same thing, levees and dikes, same thing, just different terminology, are there? And are we can, what happens if the property owner doesn't maintain that, is there, what, what's the fallback? Um, I don't know the answer to the question of how many um, levees and dikes or how many miles of levees and dikes. It's extensive. Um, Alderon Laird did um, do a vulnerability uh, assessment on levees, and I think that information's out there. I don't have it at the top of my hands, uh, top of my head, but I can bring that information back. Um, the concept here would be that at least in this small scale, we'd be looking to uh, you know, establish, you know, this could be done through maybe an assessment district or, you know, I, I don't necessarily think it's uh, fair to levy all of the costs, no pun intended, on those uh, landowners to create the and, and maintain the sea level rise protection because that zone really does facilitate uses throughout the city with the wastewater treatment plant being where it's at. So, you know, we, we, to implement this, we'd have to get into a, a much broader public discussion about, you know, how to fund these. But I think the, the concept here is that at least within this new, you know, what's labeled on this map as protection zone or zone one in our new maps, we would have easements and the city would maintain these ultimately, and they would be funded through, you know, local and hopefully state and federal funds as well. So there's, the private property, I mean, is it expensive? I mean, that's just really scary to me that, you know, what if the owner can't afford it and they let the levees go or something happens? That seems kind of serious to me. Yeah, that's part of the reason why uh, in this plan, the city of Arcata would take that easement and maintain, would carry on that, that long-term maintenance uh, of those facilities. Um, and, you know, the reality is, is that, again, the, the funding sources at this point are speculative. I know the state's working on um, a funding source right now that's going to help jurisdictions, uh, uh, you know, plan a shovel-ready pipeline of projects to work on adaptation um, projects. 
And so we're looking forward to seeing more information on that through 2022, and I'll share that with the, the um, Planning Commission when that comes out. Um, but essentially that could be, you know, those kinds of funding streams are being developed and they could be leveraged to help, you know, initiate and or maintain, you know, projects like this in the future. Um, and so some of this is basically, you know, at this, at this point we're trying to identify the, the policy and the uh, zoning that would allow these programs to be implemented. Um, and trying to establish a framework that will ensure that they are maintained, um, you know, for as long as we can, uh, you know, with the resources that we have available to us. Now, the, the policy doesn't commit to any specific elevation. Right now, we think we can probably do 15 to 17 feet, um, at least with the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and we think that that's reasonable, but it could be that, you know, even after enacting this policy, if we can't generate the funds to, to you know, to build it out, or if we can't generate the funds to maintain it long-term, um, you know, and these, the, the levees are relatively stable. I mean, you look at it, we have earthen dike levees protecting the most of Humboldt Bay. They were not engineered. That's literally just piled up mud. And those have been standing for 100 years. Now, some of those are also starting to fail, you know, as, as winter storms are, are causing erosion and sea level rise will start to overtop. Um, so I, I think that, you know, the two take home messages here are that, you know, one, we do need to see, um, you know, a, an entity. We can't leave this up to the verities of, you know, individual property owners to maintain. Um, so we do need to see an entity maintaining this. Um, and it would be great if we could develop an entity region wide, you know, JPA or, a, you know, dike reclamation district or something like that that could maintain the dikes uh, region wide. Um, but that, that just hasn't happened yet. And then number two, that once these things are built, I mean, I think that they, you know, they're expensive to build, but once they're built, they're relatively stable. Okay. And then... Um Regarding our, our wastewater treatment plant, what's the Coastal Commission's opinion on having where it's located? Um, we are going through the coastal development permit process right now for the wastewater treatment plant improvement project. It's been broken into two phases. Um, and um, I uh, am, you know, I, I, would, I would need to lean on uh, Nate Tricotri, our, our city engineer, and Emily Sinkhorn, our environmental services director, and their teams uh, to get into any detail at all with you about what, what um, those, those um, you know, projects entail and, and the timelines on them. Uh, but the Coastal Commission is currently reviewing our application. Uh, we received a, a, a request for more information on the sea level rise uh, sections. Um, and so I, I can't tell you specifically what they think, but I can tell you that we're kind of going through that process right now and we'll, we'll know more um, in, in the near future. Okay, and I have one final question, sorry. Um, you, you have used the term several times, um, releasing assets. Exactly what do you mean by that? I'm sorry, what type of asset? Releasing assets. You, you would mention uh, several times during several meetings about releasing assets. Hopefully we won't have to release assets. What exactly does that mean? Oh, right. Yeah, so um, so an alternative view and, and um, you know, perhaps, I mean, I don't want to try and represent the, the Coastal Commission, but my understanding of the residential guidance for sea level rise adaptation, for example, that they've provided is that instead of doing something to protect this zone, what you should do instead is to, um, you know, set policies that essentially uh, remove development rights within this zone. And so if a, if a property comes in and it was burned down, you tell them, I'm sorry, you can't rebuild. Or if a property comes in and they want to, you know, do an addition, you tell them, I'm sorry, you can't do an addition. And then over time, through attrition, as these properties, you know, become damaged or burned down or, uh, you know, as, as prop properties become, you know, uh, you know, unused for whatever other reason, um, that you just essentially don't allow new uses into them. Um, and in that way, you will have over time, just naturally through attrition, have removed all of the uses in this zone. Um, and, and so that's one way of going about that. And, and when I look at that plan, when I look at the images that they show for how this would work, um, 
you know, as an, as an economic development thinker, as, as a, a, you know, former redevelopment agency uh, employee, what I see is blight. What I see is planned blight, that we intentionally are devaluing properties today. If I tell you that your neighborhood that you, that you live in, you can no longer develop or build or maintain or rebuild, your property value has gone down today, to, you know, immediately. As soon as I say that that's our new policy, you no longer can sell your property. Um, so you have zero dollars in your value. And so instead, we're taking the approach and, and that will have ramifications for not only the property owners in that area, uh, but for the people who are living in, in those areas. This, is, this area ha also happens to house one of our lowest income census tracts, has one of our uh, highest uh, um, uh, populations of uh, Hispanic uh, po folks, probably uh, rivals uh, areas within the Valley West. Um, and so we have uh, you know, lower income uh, people of color and you're going to tell them that their property is now valueless if they own it, or you're going to tell them that you know the the owner of this property is no, no longer likely to maintain and manage it and and improve it uh, because their their property is valueless now. Um, so that's that to me is a, uh, you know both from the direct um, you know implications of having buildings go you know basically broken windows vacant. Uh, to the implications on the impact to the individuals that live and own property in that area uh, as a recipe for blight. And instead, what we're proposing is an alternative that allows for a slow transition through uh, economically uh, improving the area towards new land uses that you know, support a lower intensity uh, on, on that land base and are uh, more readily um, um, you know, released that you can, you know, move, you know, fall back and, and um, retreat from that, um, that asset in the future more easily. At the same time, we need to plan for, you know, where all those uses are going to occur elsewhere in the city. We have the same issue that folks have been concerned with. Well, if you change the zoning in the gateway, you know, where do, um, you know, where all these uses move to uh, that are considered non-conforming and again, for these properties, you know, they would be with this new land use, they'd be considered non-conforming potentially if we, you know, if we made it so that you couldn't redevelop them, uh, but they'd be able to continue to, um, to, co to exist in their current status. So we, we need to do an overall planning that, that takes into consideration not just what's gonna happen in that zone, not just how those uses are going to defease over time, but also how we, uh, plan for where those uses migrate to within the city of Arcata. All right, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Figueroa. Oh. All right. So, uh, David, just a quick question regarding, um, well, I, like, I like the alternative transition. That sounds like the way to go in regards to creating blight and, you know, for, for individuals' properties and so forth. Doesn't seem like that'd be the appropriate measure in regards to how it would be dealing with you know this community, this part of our community. Um, the question I have is, you know, we're generating, we're creating language in our local coastal program that you know that says protection zone, right? And we have protection zone specifically related to our own infrastructure and communities within this area. Um, where does it come? Where does it get to the point where um, we're forced, um, you know, to uh, to use eminent domain and condemnation in respects to specifically not necessarily the properties but the levies um, to protect the protection zone? Um, and you know, where is it? You know, where does it fall in line where it becomes a public safety issue? Yeah, those are uh, really great questions that I'm probably not fully ready to to address. Um, I think that's definitely a big policy question. Um, the the couple of things that I will say is that you know we are we own a lot of the land that surrounds this uh, area, and really it's just this back edge here that we don't own. Um, and so, you know, we continually uh, seek to acquire new properties uh, that we can use for, you know, near term, you know, the uh, restoration agricultural purposes like you see on the Baylands, uh, as well as, um, you know, for, for future adaptation purposes. And 
So I would say, you know, I, I, I don't foresee the city needing to go that route. Um, certainly the city has those police powers, but I really don't think it would be applicable here. Um, I also think that the majority of these landowners um, that, you know, you know, are, are butting up against this, this low lying area here, um, even if they're reluctant now to give the city an easement, uh, when they start to see, you know, tides, you know, six times a year, you know, lapping at the back door, they're probably going to be real quick to, to, you know, offer up an easement. Yeah, that sounds like probably this is going to be the situation. So, it's, so is that a uh, fall in line with, you know, I've just seen um, in regards of uh, the purchasing of the Christie property by environmental services? Is this kind of the approach that we're going for? So I know we got mitigation needs, obviously, for what we're doing for the improvements for the uh, wastewater treatment facilities, but and also other needs on our other projects that we have in the city. But is this uh, one of the big pushes in acquiring that property? Property. Yeah, that, that is definitely a consideration. Um, and when the uh, Christie's agent reached out to us and, and let us know that it was on the market, um, you know, that was certainly the first thing that I thought of. Commissioner White, did you have some questions? I, I think that Christian kind of covered, I was just also weighing in or agreeing with that. I think it's better to utilize those properties as much as and as long as we can so that we're not displacing the poorest of the poor. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the coastal commercial visiting, visitor serving and how that might um, affect those people if there is some transition and is there any funding opportunities or in place or in plans to help those folks if they are displaced for that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, we have, um, you know, on multiple uh, on multiple fronts. I mean, there's there's a lot of change going on in our communities, and it's going to, you know, change has a tendency to affect different people differently. Um, and I think that, um, you know, what I what I like to be able to say is that we will, you know, have programs. Oops, that's not what I meant to do have programs in place so that, you know, we can, oh, darn it, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> trying to zoom in on this map here, um, programs in place that would allow us to, uh, you know, assist everyone that needs it in these zones. And so kind of just zooming in here, what you can see is uh, this entire area right here is zoned residential. Um, and it also has this CCV overlay zone. Um, and so these, these people would be, you know, vulnerable to this transition. And, you know, I think that's a, you know, there's kind of a double-edged sword here. I mean, in, in one, you know, on the one side, we can say, well, you know, we want to make sure that these people aren't forced out, so let's not have the CCV, the commercial visitor serving overlay on these properties so these uses don't transition. Uh, you know, before, you know, before their time, so to speak, um, you know, before it's, before sea level rise impacts are imminent. Um, and then, you know, and then removing that to protect those current uses also has the, you know, the negative impact of not preparing the site for, for future sea level rise. Um, and so that really is, you know, I think that that would be an important recommendation for the, the planning commission to consider, to deliberate and make a recommendation of the council ultimately. Um, we have, uh, you know, any project, any program that we're involved in, um, we, uh, you know, with, with financially, with our, our grant programs, for example, we have relocation assistance for those. Uh, but right now, we're just in this county and in this city, woefully behind on house, housing production. And so for, you know, if, if someone were to come in and say, you know, I'm gonna invest in this entire block and I'm gonna displace everybody in this entire block or, you know, buy two of the, you know, multifamily projects and I'm gonna displace 20 families, there's nowhere in Arcata for 20 families to move right now. Um, I, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find, uh, you know, 20 households tomorrow f for, you know, in, a, in the county. Um, so I do think that those are important implications to consider. Um, 
you know, one thing we could do is not add the CCV overlay now. And then once we've completed our infill planning elsewhere in the city and we're actually starting to see, you know, investment in those infill areas uh, throughout the city that, um, you know, that we then come back and add this layer to that area. And, you know, so that we're sure that there's gonna be some place for those people to land. Um, we could also, you know, get creative about programs for, um, you know, for development. One of the, one of the, um, you know, concepts behind the gateway area is that in addition to the form-based code that gives, uh, you know, the community and the developers certainty around what the city of Arcata is willing to accept in terms of the building type and the way that it looks, the massing and scaling and so on and so forth, there's also this amenities program. And if through that amenities program, you know, we could connect uh, willing uh, property owners in this area that wish to transition their uses. Maybe I own a, own a, a house in an ADU, uh, you know, in this area, and I want to, you know, take advantage of the CCV and transition to, say, a, a short-term rental. Um, and that would mean, you know, uh, evicting my, my long-term tenants who have worked, who've lived there. And then I can connect those people with someone who's just built property in the gateway zone and make sure that they have, you know, somewhere to land in Arcata. You know, that could be an amenity that's built into the, to the gateway plan, an amenity that ties to, you know, relocation. Um, so we could get creative with, with programs like that. I, and, and I, I want to be clear, I'm just kind of like shooting from the cuff here, trying to get, be creative around, you know, how we could manage these, these types of um, transitions. But I, I do think that's an important policy consideration. Um, there's, you know, almost a, a truism in climate change and adaptation planning that the people who are most vulnerable have the highest impacts from climate change. Uh, adaptation policy, and this is a, a high-risk area. So thank you for identifying that. Could you tell me at what point would you be anticipating the Planning Commission to make those kinds of recommendations? Is that forthcoming like soon, now? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you just daylighted the issue. I think if you wanted to have, you know, the conversation um, or if you want to, you know, think on it and, you know, we could pick it up at a study session or, I mean, it's really, it's up to the, to the commission to really guide that, that uh, discussion. I, I, yeah, I was just, you know, and um, it talks about the city's continuing to protect and defend significant investments or feasible. And I guess I'm just trying to clarify, like, what does a significant investment mean? Like, yeah, that's a great question. That's probably um, not terribly clear to a lot of people. So specifically what that policy ties to is the conclusion that this area that's identified here in CCV primarily, uh, with a couple of other ancillary par properties over here, that those should be protected. Uh, that we should defend those areas, you know, with both hard and soft armoring. Um, areas like the Baylands, you know, we have a, you know, a couple cattle that live on them. You know, sure, the rancher is going to be upset. The cattle maybe, you know, love this space, but, you know, they'll find greener pastures. Um, and, and so this area may be less uh, feasible to throw a whole lot of money at defending. Um, it might be more, you know, uh, uh, more effective to use those lands as the first, uh, uh, you know, accommodation zone. So we would look to, you know, try and create habitats that try and maintain the salt marsh habitat, for example, as seawater sea rises. Um, you know, and, and so that would require modification of the landscape. And that's where we put the dollars onto this property as opposed to in a, a, a you know, a levy to try and protect it long term. This area over here, again, back in 2017 dollars, I think it was, has $141 million worth of, uh, you know, assets, public and private. Uh, it also generates significant revenue, uh, tax, uh, sales tax revenue. Uh, in the course of the year. And so this area has, uh, you know, a lot of dollars that are uh, either already invested or are continuously generated from it. And so it makes sense to put a levy around this. That's where those significant assets are, or significant investment is in the, the built environment, South GNH Street, and then some of these properties off Samoa. 
So when you say as long as the benefits of protection outweigh the costs, I guess who determines that? I mean, obviously the people that live there feel like that's pretty important. Yeah, it, it really is a, a you know, simple feasibility analysis. If we have the funds to do it, if we have the approvals to do it, if we have the uh, ability to do it and we do it, then, then we'll defend. Um, if any of those elements are missing, if we can't get the permits because the Coastal Commission doesn't agree, uh, if we can't generate the revenue to actually build the levees, then we won't be able to. And it could be that, you know, right now we're projecting that we could, that it's financially feasible to do this to 17 feet in elevation. Um, it could be that we start this effort and get to, you know, 14 feet in elevation, which will, again, 14 feet of elevation is going to buy a lot of time uh, as long as, you know, it, sea level rise doesn't continue to accelerate um, and outpace us. So we get to 14 feet of elevation and we realize at that point, you know, hey, look, this, uh, this program was working, but now it's no longer financially feasible. We don't have the revenue sources to maintain it. Everyone is now put on notice that, you know, 14 feet is our trigger elevation. Uh, based on what we see, we'll give people a, a you know, best guess estimate as to when the, those uh, levees would start to be overtopped. And again, we got to remember, this is going to be a slow progression. And so when levees start getting overtopped or when, you know, groundwater starts uh, inundating uh, from below, um, you know, those are going to be periodic events initially. Right now in Florida, for example, they have, you know, sunny day flooding when the, you know, the tides come up through the storm drains, they flood the streets, uh, but they don't happen all, all, every day, all year long. If you were to look at the maximum inundation footprint of those areas, though, you would see that, you know, they go quite a bit inland. So we'll have the same thing happen here, is that at some point we'll say, look, we can't defend this anymore. And at that point, there will still be a time frame when those uses will be serviceable. Um, uh, and, and really, depending on the trajectory of, of, you know, climate change and sea level rise for us, um, you know, those, those uses may be, uh, you know, indefinitely feasible, you know, with that periodic nuisance flooding, or it could be that sea level rise continues to overtop those and they become permanently inundated. So there's just, there's a lot of unknowns. And I think those unknowns and that, that low probability of, of uh, event is what drove us ultimately towards the recommendation and, and drove the decision makers towards the recommendation to, uh, to adopt a strategy that, that tries to take advantage of near-term and medium-term uh, 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 economic output from the area, um, you know, as, as we have it. And it also uh, forestalls this decision this, that we have to make about, you know, sh social justice. Uh, it also provides, uh, you know, economic opportunity for, you know, employment opportunity uh, in, the, in the near term. And it also doesn't throw those neighborhoods into, you know, uh, essentially, uh, you know, precipitous decline in value by coming out and stating that, hey, you know, these, these things are valueless today because you can't build on them. So there's, there's a lot of upsides to the, the strategy that we're doing, I think. Could I ask one more question? I know that it's not a crystal ball and we don't know whenever that trigger is going to be. And the unknown question that bothers me the most is what happens to those people? Are they on their own? Or is this the point where we come in and we trigger that we're going to, um, you know, help these folks who are going to be displaced, whatever that, you know, sea level rise number is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I really do hesitate to predict. I mean, I think it really depends on, you know, what those impacts are. Um, you know, if we get a, uh, you know, all it takes is one ice sheet. You know, if we get a significant up, you know, increase in sea level rise in the near term, then again, we're in more of a hazard um, mitigation scenario. We're, we're in more of an emergency response scenario. And I suspect that, you know, yeah, we'd have, you know, Red Cross and, and you know, uh, hazard, you know, designation at the state and federal levels potentially. And, and, you know, funds would be probably released and made available to, to relocate people. But, I mean, that's all just pure speculation. But then we've moved from planning to disaster. Yeah. And that's not a good place to be, obviously. Not for these folks anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it, you know, really the, um, you know, the, the intent here is to create policies that do form or cluster around, you know, a 
planning horizon. It's, it's a little bit of a challenge because our typical planning horizon is like, you know, 20 years or sometimes we'll make a, you know, 30 year plan, but that's really reaching out there because uh, there are a lot of unknowns at that point. Um, and so, you know, I think we are really challenged with this uh, long range planning work where we can project out, uh, you know, with a high degree of uncertainty, but we can project out scenarios. Um, and we just, you know, we don't, we don't have sort of the, the certainty of the, the near term, um, you know, decision making process, so. I, I promise this is just my last question. So if, what would it look like if we did delay the, com, the coastal commercial visiting serving overlay zone until we had some kind of agreement or benefits with developers over in the gateway where they might be able to help um, move these and relocate these people. I mean, what would that do to, I know you wanna like start thinking about we're gonna be, you know, that's, that's money in the hand if, if we can, you know, capitalize on that. But at the same time, once we put that overlay and there's no plan for these people, where do they go? Like, like you said, right now, if that were to happen, we could have all of these families displaced and no plan in, in place for them. Yeah, I mean, I think it could be done in two steps and that would ameliorate some of the concern about that. Cause I, I could see, you know, one of two, um, you know, probable scenarios for that area. I mean, if, um, you know, the, the dream is that, you know, someone for instance, you know, buys the scrapyard and turns it into an RV park. RV parks are, you know, have almost zero built environment. Um, they're highly resilient to, uh, to flooding. So if it's flooding part of the year, you just don't use the RV park at that time. And then ultimately, if it becomes such that, you know, it's flooded most of the year, um, that's a very easy asset to remove. And so, you know, but, but clearly we're not just gonna have hundreds of RV parks in this area, you know, so there are other uses, use types. Um, I can see those properties where there's already, you know, housing units more than likely being converted to some sort of, a, a you know, tourist accommodations. Um, and so, you know, most likely scenarios that they, that, you know, some investor buys the house, you know, maybe it's a local, you know, family that has some extra income, they buy a house and then they turn it into a SRVO, a, a short stay rental. Uh, for for tourists, um, you know, another uh, idea or scenario is that you know they could buy up multiple parcels, combine them, and then maybe build a, a boutique hotel or something like that. You know, it's a little more infrastructure out there, um, but it you know so you'd have have to contend with removing that at some point. So I don't know, you know, there's just a lot of speculation on how that property could get used. Um, and I think ultimately breaking it into two steps where you adopt the CCV onto the pink properties first. And then once we've developed a, a better plan for relocation, uh, adopt it onto the, the, the uh, multifamily properties next, you know, it's a, a very viable um, suggestion. Thank you. Are there any other? Uh, it's looking a lot like uh, this document is nearing completion. And uh, my question is, what is the uh, process from this point going forward what, before we get to implementation? Yeah, um, the, I mean, this is a draft document. Um, I think I sort of jokingly mentioned last time that I've been working on it my entire career here and if I and if it takes uh, the rest of my career as long as we get it done before I retire then um, I'll be happy um, but but I do think that you know we've we've worked with the Coastal Commission staff I think this document had three iterations of review um, and it was reviewed not only by the local staff but also by the state staff in particular around the um, sea level rise policy and the uh, water quality policy. And so we feel like it's a fairly well vetted document uh, in terms of the you know, general direction that we've received through that, that uh, engagement leading up to this, the decisions that were made by the Council of Planning Commission leading up to this and the document that you have before you. But similar to the you know, concern that we've heard from folks on the gateway plan, you know, hey, this is the first time we've, we've seen it, first time we've been able to flip through the pages and, and make specific comments on what's in there. Um, it really is up to the decision makers at this point, you know, the, to what timeline to put this on. 
Um, if we put it on a, a near-term timeline, I can see it getting, getting to the Coastal Commission sometime early next year. Uh, and that would mean spending the next couple of months, you know, gathering public input on the document and, you know, considering recommendations for uh, revisions and, and then making those revisions. Um, and if we go on a longer, uh, you know, longer term approval where, you know, the, the public wants to sit with this and have more time with it, uh, you know, by all means, I mean, there's, there's no specific end date. I think we've got enough of a product right now um, to, to satisfy the Coastal Commission for the, the de grant deliverable. Uh, they gave us a 2020, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2018 grant, I think it was, uh, to produce this work. And the intent was, the original scope was to complete the local process and be ready for submittal. Um, uh, but I, th I think they'll be flexible once they see the documents that we have, uh, you know, produced and that we're, you know, basically in the final public process in, in the review of these documents, so. Do we have any members of the public that have any comments? More comments. Oh, okay. Okay, um, I asked some questions before I have some comments as well. Um, uh, first, I, I think there's some absolutely brilliant stuff in here. And the, the way the pieces fit together is, is, is finally hanging together as, as a whole that's um, making a fair amount of sense. I was super skeptical about your, your blight resistance argument for, um, the pink and yellow area down there and what you were calling the peninsula um, for a long time. But with the kinds of um, protections you have to prevent overdevelopment and to make sure that areas that had been damaged by flooding would not be further damaged, it's making a lot more sense. Um, I think that this draft hasn't gone far enough in restricting um, that type of development though and in providing incentives for landowners to make better choices in the future. Um, to that effect, I, I think your idea of, of either leaving the CCV out for the time being or have it um, come in at some incremental point in the future is, is really wise as far as not displacing low-income residents who might find that they have nowhere else to go in Arcata. Um, but I also think that it doesn't make sense for the city to continue to subsidize reinvestment in areas of high risk um, without also providing a way for um, the city to be reasonably protected in the future. So there were provisions in here for people who insist on rebuilding areas um, on properties that had been damaged for that rebuilding to count as new construction and be subject to um, building codes that would that new construction would be subject to. I think that makes a lot of sense, um, but I think the city needs to go a step farther, which would be to insist that anyone who insists on reinvesting in that area not only be subject to um, the, the kinds of restrictions here in the code, but to affirmatively sign a document that agrees ahead of time that they will um, vacate and clean up their site at the benchmark when the city says that that's gonna happen. That's going to eliminate um, risks of people screaming unconstitutional taking later on. Um, and I think that at the point when um, property owners are investing in new development, whether it's on their own property that they've owned for a long time or whether it would change use or in intensify use, which I don't think is a great idea, 
um, I, th I think that they should be asked to put up some sort of a guarantee, some sort of a bond that would also contribute to a fund that the city or they themselves could draw on later to cover the costs of helping them vacate the site, clean it up, and possibly relocating, um, remembering that many of these properties are absentee ownerships with tenants who can't necessarily go anywhere else, um, and those owners should also understand that one of the costs of um, having a profitable investment in a risky area, an area where the city is subsidizing um, their continued uh, decision to take those risks, um, w will be to um, help provide for the eventual um, vacation and relocation of their tenants or of themselves. Um, there are a lot of precedents for that kind of fund. Um, it would give the city resources that wouldn't require us to wait for the state or the federal government to come up with some kind of relocation or disaster grants. Um, the city would retain control of it. Private owners, um, if it went with the land, the next owners of that not blighted property would be able to take advantage of the previous owner's investments. Um, it, in a sense, it could be kind of like a reverse easement, um, but it, it would make it very clear that um, investments in this area, um, which in effect the city would be heavily subsidizing, um, through protection um, are, are subject to conditions that investment in other properties in Arcata might not be. And I think this would protect residents, it would protect landowners, it would protect the city. I'm also kind of horrified at the idea of anything in this plan um, advocating additional housing in that high-risk area, including mobile homes, um, and frankly, including even um, accessory dwelling units. So if, if that constitutes a gradual you know, disinvestment in the area, um, it, it, it might very well, but I think the idea of, of transitioning to alternative uses is, is a really, really sound one. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I, I like the idea that there will be opportunities for um, continued use in those areas. I don't like the idea that the city may end up holding the bag in the end um, for owners who have chosen to take risks. Um, when they had other choices. So I want to protect tenants. I, I want to prevent blight. Um, I want to understand that residential development, um, people sleeping overnight on unconsolidated soils with rising sea levels is just not a good thing for the city to subsidize. So, um, I, I, I wrote some of this down, and I've given um, David a set of these comments. Um, it's, I think a bunch of this stuff is stuff people have already said. I don't think the city should put, you know, the use of eminent domain off the table. I think it's a super valuable tool, and, and especially, you know, if, if we already have a source um, of funds with which to offer compensation, um, it, it can actually further these goals in a way that offers the city a lot more flexibility and protects landowners. Um, and f finally, um, the wastewater treatment plant, um, the city's already committed to, what, $60 million to upgrade the plant? I, I can't remember the exact figure. Um, 
and that was, in sh it, that was assuming a slightly lower rate of population growth than I think we're currently looking at um, with the Cal Poly projections. And it seems to me that one of the amenities that really needs to be offered as part of the gateway plan or any, any other um, plan to provide additional density and subsidy, uh, subsidies and, and land use controls elsewhere in town would, would be to give a big, big bonus to any kind of innovation that will keep sewage out of the plant. That may mean lowering some densities and some housing developments to allow for some of those innovative systems to be decentralized. Um, there are all kinds of things that can happen. And I, I would just throw out a challenge to developers and to Cal Poly to start thinking through some of those innovative technologies so that Arcata can stay on the forefront of what we do with our, with our um, wastewater. Um, in the way that we have been for the last generation. So, good. Who else had questions? Somebody else was raising their hands. Was it Commissioner White? Am I allowed to say bravo? That's brilliant. <laughs> I really appreciated what you put forth there, Judith. Um, I think that's an excellent solution of putting together a reserve for developers in that particular area so that um, the city's not left holding the bag and those folks that are underserved or you know in a socioeconomic status that if they do get displaced there is a way for them to um, you know there's a saving grace there's something that's going to be there waiting for them and clean up so that the city's not also so if they do choose to stay that there there's a way to deal with that um, I was just wanting to know, is there a map, or, or can you show us a map of the uh, the local coastal with the gateway and what that might look like as far as if there's any conflicting? I'm sorry, was the question, can I show a map of the... The local coastal plan and the gateway and how they might fit together and where there might be some overlap. Yep. Okay, so this was uh, from the March 2nd uh, meeting with the, the city council. And so again, it'd be a, a great meeting to go back and watch again. Um, and you'll get a, a more detailed uh, discussion around uh, how the different areas within the coastal zone, um, you know, how they, they interact with our, our local coastal program. Uh, but right here, this is uh, this this map is just sort of floating on top of the aerial image. Uh, is our currently adopted uh, local coastal program map, uh, and it shows the boundary in a thick black line with uh, here's the plaza and uh, areas north that are outside the coastal zone, and then the areas that are inside the coastal zone to the south. This little uh, heartbeat right here, uh, EKG is this zag right here. So there's, that's how it maps over. Uh, and this blue line continues and drops down right there. So that's the coastal zone. Uh, and the, and this is in the gateway area plan as well. If you look in your gateway area plan, this figure, this underlying figure, um, which, okay. Uh, is not not exactly like this. I've identified the areas that are in the CADEX zone here, but um, but this underlying figure is in your gateway area plan and it shows the coastal zone boundary. 
Um, these areas that are hashed out, so here's here's just to orient you real quick, here's the wing inflatables or the wing, wing the slack, pro I'm sorry, <laughs> it's been a long day apparently. The Winkle Floyd property or the old uh, part of the barrel district here. Um, here's K Street right here. There are the two metal buildings on the corner of K, the gas station. Uh, so that orients you real quick. Um, the added information that's on this map that's not in the gateway area plan is that this entire zone right here and then this entire zone right here inside the gateway area is also in the categorical exclusion zone. And so that's an area where a uh, coastal development permit is not required if the use is principally permitted. And so it's just important to note, you know, a lot of folks are uh, concerned over, you know, the city uh, allowing principally permitted uses. Um, there, there are already tons of principally permitted uses, and in fact, in this area right here, part of the gateway area, there's already a, a precedent and a, a process in place that allows for uh, no public review of pub pr principally permitted uses. So that's how those two overlap. This is the northern boundary of the coastal zone, and this yellow line is the gateway area. David, what, what's what's the little, what's the block that's between those those two shaded areas? This here? Yeah. Uh, there's actually uh, remnants of a creek that uh, meander through here. And so the Coastal Commission retains jurisdiction here, actually. We don't issue coastal development permits on this little sliver. Um, and they only put this Cat X area on properties that don't have coastal resources. And so because there was a creek here, tidally influenced creek, uh, this area did not get the CADEX area. All right, are we ready to move on to our next item? Did you wanna um, take public comment? Oh, oh, is there public comment? Uh, if yes, you okay. have a comment you'd like to make, please raise your hand. I'm not, no, okay, we do have one. Go ahead, Jim. Oh. Hi, hello, Planning Commission this evening and to the staff. Uh, just one quick question. It sounds like some pretty serious discussion happening with South Key and wondering at what point you might make that more point apparent to the property owners down in that area. I realize it's very early in the process and it's very real and it's something that um, it would be good for them to understand and realizing it could happen at different rates, but just the same, just table it to them so everybody's on the same page with it. And that's really about it. I mean, it's good that you're bringing it up because it's really important and uh, it sounds like everybody should be aware, to, aware of it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public? Okay, so just one final question. What concerned me is when um, Commissioner Mayor and you were talking about um, possibly not allowing property owners to rebuild if their house is destroyed or burns down or whatever, that sort of thing. So th that could really hurt the property owner if uh, their insurance would cancel them if they weren't able to rebuild it. So just remember if that happens, they're gonna be losing their total investment. Um, and not only that, but the renters, um, it would cause blight, obviously. Why would they keep up a property if they're, you know, they're never gonna get their money back out of it. But the renters wouldn't be able to get renters insurance and there would be all kinds of problems. So we need to keep in mind all of it, you know, the whole circle of it. That was the only comment that I had that I, um, it was alarming to me 
Um, in fact, I, I could just see insurance companies, I mean, you know, insurance rates in California have gone up so high because of fires and whatnot. But um, even if the insurance companies possibly got wind that this could happen, they could possibly cancel or really jack up those owners' insurance, um, which they're just going to pass that on to the land, uh, the tenants and possibly raise their rent. So we need to be really um, walk carefully there so we don't hurt anyone, tenants or the owners. That was the only comment I had. So if we're ready to move on, we have another item, which is an update on the current development projects. Do we have a staff report on that? Yeah, um, so I, I was asked by the chair a couple of weeks ago to bring forward a uh, presentation on current development projects in process. And I am hoping that I will have access to the list that I have for you for that. I haven't, uh, haven't ground tested this. And when I, when I put that on the agenda, I was thinking I would be at my desk. So let me see if I can navigate to this. But um, basically what we've done is we've gone through and we've looked at uh, building permits that are in process that haven't been approved, building permits that have been approved over the last year, and then I believe we have a, a short list of projects that we know are coming forward to the Planning Commission. So give me just one moment while I, I try and pull that up. Okay. Let me let me check in with Dylan to make sure I'm going to be able to project this. So this will not be uh, projected per se onto this monitor, but you'll see it on your screens, and you'll see it on on these screens, and the public will be able to see it. So. This is a truly hybrid meeting. We're using all of the various uh, resources we have at our disposal. Okay. Okay. So what I have before you here is the uh, list of, let me move this out of the way. Uh, this is the list of projects that are currently in building permit review, um, and uh, they are, are pending approval. And so I, I haven't included every single building permit that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, because the, um, you know, there are, there are literally hundreds. What I've done, because I think the, the request was mostly around like new, you know, residential development, is I limited the, the search function to uh, just new um, residential projects. And so what you have here is the date they applied, the permit number, where the project is located and what kind of project it is. And so, you know, you'll see we've got, you know, several second units going in, uh, new ADU, the different people type these in with different, um, you know, uh, descriptions, but basically permit existing second unit is the same as uh, ADU. New single family residence is new SFR. Um, we have some duplexes coming in, uh, new second unit, uh, new second unit AU. 
new single family residence with attached garage. So you can see the vast majority of these are accessory dwelling units. We have, one of the things that I, that I noticed when I look back on this and also on the, the projects that were permitted in the recent past is that we have literally an explosion of accessory dwelling units going on right now. We're, once we've compiled data from this uh, year and probably um, maybe next year, we'll see if the trend continues. We may need to reset our estimates on um, you know, our housing element based on how much housing we're going to get out of accessory dwelling units because we're already, I mean, just with this list that's currently in application, this is like a whole year's worth of, of um, uh, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, and these have all come in, well, some of these are, have been on the books for quite some time, you know, the ones that are, you know, back to, wow. Is, Actually, there, is there another page? Is this it? This, this is it. That's it? Yeah, this is it. And, and now that I'm looking at, at this closer, many of these date back to 2021. So these may have stalled. These permits may not be going forward. Uh, generally, we clear the books after six months, and some of these are much, much older than six months. Um, so there's only one apartment project there's, there's no in the whole list? Um, yeah, and again, I mean, I, I would just point to the fact that the available land base for higher density projects has been gobbled up. We've used it. Part of the reason why we're doing this big planning work right now is because we've literally gone through all of our uh, residential housing stock. We've done all of the easy stuff. There are a couple of subdivisions that have been approved that um, couldn't get financed because the, um, you know, the cost of building was too high. And so even though we had approvals on the books, uh, the O Street, uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, 30th Street is a good example, the Yurok housing project that was approved. It only got built because they got um, you know, millions of dollars in subsidy from the state. Uh, to support that affordable housing project. Otherwise, it would have just sat out there vacant for, you know, like it was for years. Um, we have the Q Street subdivision. Um, there are a couple of houses that have been built on that in the last year or so since it was approved. Um, but there's just not a lot of development going on right now um, because it's really expensive to build. There are quite a number of ADUs being built in the community right now. They're, they're going up. Um, if you don't have one in your neighborhood, um, I'm shocked. Um, and it's interesting too because I've gotten recent cost estimates from uh, builders and the, the cost to develop right now is, you know, like above 200 a square foot. We're used to, you know, 125 to, to 150 is sort of like, you know, entry level 150 to 175 is, you know, pretty nice, you know, uh, maybe single family residence and then custom homes start getting up into the 200s. Uh, now you can't build for under 200. So I'm not exactly sure how folks are, are doing it, but, but they are. Um, we have a number of permits that were just approved. So these are uh, permits. basically approved this year. Um, and again, you can see on this list, um, uh, let's see, the, the five, the top ones, five new dwelling units, uh, these are all the Yurok project on 30th Street. So that looks like a big, uh, you know, big uh, you know, project right there. It is a big project. It's, you know, the 30th Street. Then we've got, you know, a couple here and there, construct new duplex, bunch of ADUs. So these were approved recently. New single family, second unit, you see down on the bottom here. And new triplex. So yeah, if you're interested, I mean, I can, I can also dig into, um, you know, our housing element list and we can start looking back at that again and looking at specific properties. I mean, I'll just give you a, a real quick um, example um, here, just to give you a, a sense for, um, you know, what we're talking about. Please, yeah, fire away. So are there any updates on the loan process that may be forthcoming for ADOs? 
Um, I am still working, I'm, try, I'm trying to get a meeting with uh, Eureka staff to talk about maybe um, combining efforts and, and developing a program that could be used in both Eureka and Arcata or a similar program in both Eureka and Arcata, but we haven't, haven't connected on that yet. But I'm excited about the possibility for it. Um, let's see, here is... <laughs> Okay. What are you Share showing us? Share my screen again here. What are you showing us, David? Let's see. So what I'm show showing you here is um, uh, this is uh, you know City of Arcata, this is Curse Heights, um, and um, you can see these properties right here. Uh, you know that are treed, you know tr forested properties. Uh, just at the end of the road here, uh, kind of on the, the northern boundary there. Those are included, so all these properties right here, those are part of the original uh, Woodland Heights, Curtis Heights uh, subdivision. They were remainder parcels. Those are included in our, our housing element as properties that could potentially be developed. Um, you know, if we were to subdivide those into uh, appropriately sized parcels for the area, we'd probably get 10 houses. Um, but the reality is, is that it would be almost impossible because of the slopes and the terrain out here to, to subdivide them. There are existing legal parcels, so theoretically, you could have one house here and one house here on that property. And so single family, second unit, those, those two properties are counted in our existing housing element list as supporting four potential units, single family and an ADU on each one. The likelihood that these two parcels get developed anytime soon or potentially ever is really, really low. So we've got a lot of housing stock, a lot of, I'm sorry, a lot of um, properties in our housing stock that are that are like this. They're they're counted. They're possible to be developed, but they're they're not. Um, many of them are not really viable. Um, we have approximately 250. This you know this not not the exact number, but approximately 250 units on these types of properties that are vacant, currently zoned residential properties. So that was one of the reasons why in our housing element, we committed to doing this infill work and to up zoning certain areas and, and had all those opportunity zones identified. Cause yeah, it's just, it's really uh, tough right now. Um, and the developers are getting more and more creative. We just recently got a, a proposal for, uh, let me orient here. Uh, proposal for this project here, sorry, on Westwood Court. So here's, uh, you know, here's Alliance. Here's Westwood Court. Jane's Creek runs through here. There used to be a nice little shortcut. You could ride your bike through here on your way to wherever. That's been cut off. Uh, but there's uh, an apartment complex, pretty big apartment complex uh, on the backside of Westwood Court. Here's Stewart Avenue, just to uh, orient you. And, and this is where Murphy's is, just north here. So we received a uh, recent application, Planning Commission will be reviewing it uh, sometime soon for, I believe it's close to 100 new units on this property. So really uh, challenging site that, you know, has, you know, existing built environment, um, just trying to shoehorn, literally shoehorn, uh, you know, projects in. But that's one of the biggest projects that we have going on right now is a, a proposal for, for 100 units uh, that's in the planning the process. What's the name of that project? Uh, I can't remember. The, this is the Westwood uh, Apartments. Is sorry. it affordable? It's going to be affordable no, housing? No, this is market rate. Oh. It, does that site back up onto um, the land that Danco got their development approval on? It does. This is the Creekside project here, um, just uh, to the west of this project here. So yeah, we're, um, you know, we are sort of, um, in, in many regards, you know, pretty built out. Um, I'll share with you another set of properties just so I'm not leaving you with the doom and gloom message. Uh, these properties right here, 
on Stewart Court, just right across the way. Those are readily developable. If someone were to come in and you know propose a project tomorrow, um, you know we could you know readily approve that. They could have, uh, I think, under current zoning, you know four to six units on those properties. So there are there are several parcels like this that are you know basically vacant and ready to to, to be developed, um, but certainly with you know. Uh, 250 as our, you know, our count with some of them being, you know, rather hard to develop, um, you know, there's a real need for uh, upzoning and rezoning to, to accommodate our current housing element cycle of 610 and our, our future housing element uh, cycles that will, that will certainly come and, um, you know, manage that growth. Well, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? All right, so thank you. That was really helpful um, for all of us, especially when we're talking about the gateway um, next time. So do we have any correspondence or communications? Uh, the only thing I had, my uh, colleague Joe Matir wanted me to pass on that he's been working with a group of students with the Polytech on a project where they've been looking at uh, green burial. And so they'd like to come and present that to the Planning Commission uh, and we're, we're planning to do that on May 10th. And so, uh, you know, those, uh, those Polytech students are, are always willing to take on a planning challenge. Uh, this is certainly one of them. So we're, we're looking forward to sharing that with you. That sounds great, I love it. Um, so if there's anything else, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> I take so, the adjournment. Go so, ahead. Sorry about that. I, I do have a question. Um, a couple of months ago, I, I'm losing count of how many meetings. Um, I had asked if the city could give us a briefing on um, the city's planning and regulatory authority over land that is owned off campus by either, at that time it was HSU, now it's Cal Poly, by the Humboldt State Foundation or by the Humboldt Real Estate um, Holding Corporation. That was um, before they announced that they're already looking for a design build proposal for the Crafts Craft, Craftsman's Mall and there's several other properties that um, are also important in that respect. And uh, n now that we're kind of at, at crunch time and it appears that uh, the university is actually gonna select someone to develop that plan, I think the Planning Commission really, really needs to know where the city stands legally um, on those types of properties. Um, so if there's any way that we can um, get a really good briefing um, possibly from this, the city's legal counsel, that would be very helpful. Um, that when I was looking into it, there, there are all kinds of links that separate um, those land holding entities from the university that's actually controlled by the California State University's legislation, and they were set up deliberately to, to shelter those entities from those laws. Um, and so it's super confusing to, for a, a non-lawyer to try and unravel exactly um, who can claim that they are exempt from the city's planning and regulatory authority on which land. Um, and that's something right now I think we really need to know. Uh, also, if they are exempt, are there any ways that um, the city can actually um, have a, a, a very direct influence and effect on decisions about that land? Is, is there any idea when that might be coming to us? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I'm still trying to prepare that and then also coordinate with uh, HSU to have a representative who can and speak to the Planning Commission as well. Um, so I, I don't have a timeline on that yet, um, but I am working on it. And um, thank you for the reminder. 
Okay, thank you. And with that, we will adjourn the meeting.